we are in a series entitled Bad Weather, dealing with the storms of life. Bad weather, dealing with the storms of life. Listen to me. When we say storm, we say storm, we are talking about any extended event or any series of events that are uncomfortable, uncertain, and most importantly, unwanted in our lives. And here's what we said last week that we got to be reminded of, that storms will happen. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter. There's nowhere you can run. There's nowhere you can hide. Storms will happen. The Bible lets us know this. Job declared in Job chapter 14, verse 1, here's what it says, mortals, humans, born of woman are of few days and full of trouble. And Jesus is trying to encourage his uh, disciples before he leaves them and takes his place at the right hand of the Father. And in John chapter 16, verse 33, Jesus says this, I have told you these things. So that in me you may have peace. Why? Because in this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. This is what we said. Make sure that we're clear, we're on the same page that storms have a pattern. Right? That we're, there are storm seasons, storms have a pattern, but because they have a pattern, the good news is we know that they're not permanent, but because we know storms will come, storms require preparation. This series has an intent to prepare you to see the storm when it's coming so that you can, here it is, shorten it, survive it, and if you can't do either one of those, be successful when you come out of it. Okay, here it is. Let's jump in to week number two. Uh, I want to go over an entire chapter of Scripture to you today, 17 verses of Scripture, but I'll just read one. Stan, turn with me to the Old Testament book of Jonah, chapter 1. I want to look at all of Jonah chapter 1 today. Jonah chapter 1. I just want to read verse number 12. It'll be on the wall if you haven't gotten there yet. It says this. Jonah says this out loud. He says, pick me up and throw me into the sea. He replied, and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. I probably shouldn't have preached this before my anniversary. Here we go. Turn to your neighbor on your right and on your left. Look at him. Look at him with your sad face. Put your hand over your heart and tell him, my bad. May be seated. My bad. The text says, I know that it is my fault. This great storm has come upon you. My bad. You, you ever known someone that was never wrong? <laughs> don't look to your left or your right. Don't look. Don't look. My wife making a bit too much noise down there. You know, no matter what happens, they are always right. Uh, my family, we, we try our best um, to, to find something that we can all watch together. My daughter, she hates sports. and So we found this show, though, called Young Sheldon. Young Sheldon, don't judge me, Young Sheldon, it's about a boy genius who grew up in the 90s, 
Uh, and we like it because it's literally a family show in the 90s when I grew up. So I recognize everything. My wife recognizes everything. They go to church. It's a satire, all of the things. It's hilarious. But the problem is Sheldon is a genius. He's a little 10-year-old boy who's smarter than everybody in this room combined. And the problem is, because he knows so much, Sheldon likes to tell you what he knows. Sheldon always likes to tell you what's right. And the problem is, the adult counterparts in his life, his mom, his dad, his professors, they, they often tell Sheldon, they say, yeah, Sheldon, you may have been right, but you kind of said it at the wrong time. Or you said it in the wrong way. And Sheldon will say the most arrogant thing ever. He will say, but there's never a wrong time to be right. And here's the problem, y'all. Here's the problem. That people with that perception of being right often excuse themselves out of what is going wrong around them. They become the type of people who blame everybody else for everything. Okay, let me see if I can help you. I know I have some leaders in here, maybe uh, uh, some business owners in here, some thinking people in here. Here it is. Stay with me. John Maxwell, in his book, Winning with People, writes a chapter entitled The Bob Principle. This is what Maxwell says, church. He says, if Bob has a problem with Bill, and Bob has problems with Fred, and Bob has problems with Sue, and Bob has problems with Jane, and Bob has problems with Sam, then Bob is probably the problem. That if Bob has a problem with everybody else, Bob is the problem. And maybe Bob is dealing with so much drama because Bob refuses to deal with himself. This is why Jesus spoke these words in the gospel, in the gospel according to Matthew. Matthew chapter 7, verse number 3, the text says, Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own? And here's the reality. It might be tight. That's okay. You got to eat it anyway. Here's the reality that sometimes, Storms are raging in our life because we cause them. We have to be really honest and look inside and say, maybe this trouble I got myself into. That this one is my bad. It's a tough pill to swallow. I get it, but we need to deal with it because here's what I need you to get. Why this is important? Because God will let you play in that rain if you want to stay in it. That God will let you get wet, especially after he warned you a storm was coming. And the reason why I need you to understand this is because we have to stop thinking that grace is a get-out-of-jail-free card. Theologian and historian uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer would say it is cheap grace to think that you can get grace and then still keep thinking you can abuse God. Hey, uh, uh, I, I was a young minister. I'll never forget this young minister. I hadn't even been preaching two years. Uh, I was a, a faithful member of Community of Faith Church in Tallahassee, Florida, founded by Pastor Calvin J. McFadden. We were blowing and going. We had helped him plant that church and paint those walls and move those chairs. We were running out of room. We were at multiple services, and I'll never forget me and my best man in my wedding. Me and Rashid were outside. A friend of ours named Calvin was with us, and this dude walked up on the parking lot disheveled, crying hurt, broken, and he came up to us. We began to talk to him and found out he needed help. Really, he needed Jesus. He, he goes into service. He, he accepts Christ. He makes a decision for Jesus, and he becomes faithful in the church week after week and month after month. He's faithful in the church, and all of a sudden, a week went by. We didn't see him. Two weeks went by, I didn't see him. Three weeks went by, we didn't see him. Then one Sunday, service was over. We outside kicking it, shooting the breeze. We young, we college students. He pulls up in the parking lot, leaves the car running, runs out like he about to square up with us. He's hot. 
You told me Jesus was real. You told me he got his finger in my face. I'll never forget it. You told me Jesus was real and grace did this and the love of God and all of these things. And why in the world did this happen to me? And first of all, we said, hey, you're going to have to calm down. Because the S stand for save, not solve. Calm down. He calms down. He calms down. I said, what's wrong? He said, well, I told y'all what I had been dealing with, and, and I've been in court. That's why I haven't been here, because I've been in court, and I've been on trial, and they found me guilty. And now I got to go to prison. I'll never forget the look on Calvin and Rashid's face, because we all looked at each other, and it was almost like simultaneously we said the same thing. We said, you were on camera. You thought grace was going to erase your crime? I say, you, you're confused that you thought the grace that saved your soul to make you better was going to eliminate the reality that they got you on tape? You getting ready to throw Jesus away for a, stake, for a mistake you made before you met him? Oh, you thought, you thought Jesus was your get out of jail free car. No, you need to understand that this Jesus saved you so that he could keep you while you were still in your mess. I had to look at him. I had to tell him, I said, listen, grace doesn't work like that. In my Martin Lawrence voice, I had to say, sir, you brought this on yourself. This is something you're going to have to eat because it is a decision that you made yourself. And this is where we are in our text because we meet Jonah who is in a storm that he brought on himself. Jonah is a prophet in the 8th century BCE. He is historically found in 2 Kings chapter 14, verse 25. Modern scholarship teaches us that Jonah may or may not be historical in the sense of that every detail, but it is true. It has some veracity. It is this narrative, this satirical narrative, this reality of what it looks like to teach us about the character of God versus the character of us. That, that in the reality that we have to see the comparison between a faithful God and fickle people. And in the story, Jonah finds himself the recipient of issues that actually he brought on himself. Here's a problem. Even though he wants to blame God. Jonah is dealing with some drama because he doesn't like how God is showing himself to be. Here it is. God asked Jonah to go to Nineveh and preach against it, and Jonah hates Nineveh. Why? Nineveh is the capital of Assyria. Jonah is a prophet to the northern tribes of Israel, and Assyria came into Israel and carried all of his people away. They oppressed them. They put them in bondage and slavery and destroyed their land. And Jonah is like, no, fam, you want me to go back there and talk to the people who made me into what I am right now? You want me to go over there and talk to those people who hurt us and put us down and killed us and destroyed their land? And here's the other nuance that Jonah knows, that Jonah knows that God is so big that if he goes, God can change them. And here becomes the question that I've asked you all before. What do you do when you discover that God loves the people you don't love? What do you do when you discover that God loves the people that don't love you? So what Jonah does, is he runs, and he brings a storm into his life. So maybe it's not you today. You say, this ain't me. I don't know what you're talking about. Put it in your back pocket because I want to help you with these self-initiated storms. Here it is. First, number one, listen to me, middle schooler, high schooler. Sit up. Get off your phone. Hear me. Listen, be careful of intentional rebellion. Intentional rebellion. Uh, uh, yeah, be careful of intentional rebellion. Jonah chapter 1. Verse 1, watch the text. It says this, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah, here it is, ran away from the Lord 
and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. The Lord comes to Jonah and speaks with him about wanting him to give a message to Nineveh. Can we pause for a second right there and not run by that information? Because this is what I need you to hear, that God chose Jonah to give a message to Nineveh. Okay, okay. God didn't have to choose Jonah. God didn't have to use a person at all. If you read Numbers chapter 22 and Numbers chapter 23, the Lord can make a donkey talk. If you read Acts chapter 9, you find out that Paul told you the Lord cracked the sky and talked to him himself. And yet God chose Jonah. You're not getting it. Hear me. God chose you. You're still not understanding what I'm trying to tell you, that God knew who Jonah was. He knew his mess ups. He knew his mistakes. He knew his mishaps. He knew his past. He knew his perversion. He knew what he had been through. He knew what he had done. And he still chose Jonah. No, he looked at you and saw all of your dirt and all of your damage and all of the things you had done, and God still chose you. And here's the problem, that God chose us, that God chose Jonah, and Jonah run. That Jonah rebelled. I want you to see it. I want to paint good pictures for you. Maybe I just got to teach this sex today. Uh, Tell me can put it on the wall. I got a map for you. I got a map for you. I don't have a map. map. There's a map. You got to understand that instead of traveling approximately 500 miles northeast, so instead of going 500 miles northeast to Palestine, Jonah traveled 2,000 miles west to Tarshish. Did you catch what I just said? He, he should have went 500 miles east. He tried to go 2,000 miles west. That he tried to go four times the opposite direction of where God had called him. And why? Because this is what he's doing. He runs from the people. He runs from the people. He doesn't want to deal with the people in Nineveh. He doesn't like them. He, He doesn't trust them. And he doesn't want to be associated with them. He can't stand them. They're Ninevehites. They're Assyrians. I don't like those people. They've treated me bad. This is what I came to tell you today, that running from conflict doesn't eliminate your chaos. You can't correct what you won't confront. And maybe some of us have a storm simply because you won't confront some of the people causing chaos in your life. That you're unwilling to have a courageous conversation with some people who keep causing you damage. But Jonah not only runs from the people, he runs from the present. Because the text says that he ran away from the Lord. Here's what I need you to understand. Let's clarify something. Jonah does not believe that he can hide from God. He doesn't believe that. Don't don't read the text that way. If you read all of Jonah, he emphatically states that he can't. If you read Jonah chapter 2, he literally quotes Psalm 139 verse 7. Psalm 139 verse 7 says this, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If you keep reading the psalm, he says, if I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I go down and make my bed in hell, you're there. If I ride on the wings of the dawn, you're still there. Jonah knows I can't hide from this guy. I can't hide from God. And here's what I'm trying to get you to understand, that Jonah is not trying to hide his location. He's trying to hide from his vocation. He's not trying to hide in direction. He's trying to hide from his duty. Here's what he's saying, that when Jonah runs from God, he's trying to tell God, you can't make me. That God, I don't care who you are. I don't care what you say. You can't make me go. You can't make me talk. You can't make me stay. You can't make me obey you. God, you can't make me. 
Here's the problem with that because he runs from the people, he runs from the presence, then consequentially he runs for a price. The text says, he goes down to the port of Joppa. He finds a ship and pays the fare. Okay. If you read uh, the book of Jonah in the Masoretic text, you read it, read it in its original language, the text would actually say that Jonah paid its fare. Okay. Okay. Meaning, y'all, that when Jonah went down to the port, Jonah didn't buy a ticket. He didn't buy a fare. He bought its fare. Here it is. Okay, okay let me see if I can help you with this. Uh, uh, when Jonah goes down to Joppa, uh, uh, Joppa is not the Galveston port. It is not the Fort Lauderdale or the Miami port. You're not understanding me. This is not Carnival Cruise Line. This ain't Royal Caribbean. This ain't Norwegian or Virgin. This is a cargo port, meaning this ship was not made for passengers. It was made for parcels. It was made for products. So there was no fare to buy. So why would the text say, he bought its fare because Jonah didn't buy a ticket. He bought the whole ship. He bought the whole ship. Y'all, he was so adamant about running from God that he paid for the price of the whole boat. He ran so far, y'all, that he wanted to show God that not only can you not make me do it, but I'll buy the ship and then make it take me where I want to go. Here, here, here's, here's my little caveat. Here's my little caveat. Jo Jonah must have had a lapse in memory because he forgot that the ship he bought still had to get on the sea that God made. I'm going to preach it how I feel it. it. It didn't matter how much he paid for the boat when God made the water. This is what I'm trying to understand. This is what I'm trying to tell you, that rebellion will cost you. Rebellion will cost you an expense you don't have enough to pay. And if we be honest, some of us have paid for trouble or are still paying for trouble we should have never gotten ourselves into. That we paying for debt for stuff we should have never bought. Paying for in a lack of sleep for people you should have never got involved with. You, you paying for peace for decisions you should have never made because rebellion costs. It will, it will cost you something. So you got to be careful of intentional rebellion. You got to be careful of thinking that you know better than the God who made you. Here it is, he says, you got to be careful of intentional rebellion. Secondly, the text teaches us, though, to be mindful of impactful results. To be mindful of impactful results. Hope you're taking notes. You need a long pen because you have a short memory. Here it is. Jonah chapter 1, verse 4. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea. Such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God, and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. Jonah had gone below deck, where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, how can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us so that we will not perish. Let's switch gears. Maybe you don't like me today because you say you aren't Jonah. Maybe, maybe you say you the sailor. You got connected to a Jonah, and now you're in a storm. That's fine. Be a sailor. Because here's my question to you then. Who have you let buy your boat? Who have you let buy your pain? The text says that when the storm shows up, the sailors began to call on their God. 
Well, what the text is telling us is that these are polytheistic sailors, that these sailors are aware of the divine and deities, but they worship anybody and everybody. They, they have convenient gods. They, they serve whatever God makes them happy, and they're calling on everyone that they know of to find out who can help them in this moment. Then, sailors of the star, let me ask you, who is your God? What? What is your God? You say, how dare you? I'm in church. That don't mean God is your God, though. I, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, I just have to preach this. I'm sorry. I, I, I just have a question. Is, is that relationship your God? I, I, I mean, whatever relationship that is, you don't have time for anything else but that. You don't have time to do anything else but deal with this person. Or you don't have time but trying to be connected to that person. I mean, is sex your God? You just have to have the titillating touch of another individual. And now that's why you can't focus and you're strung out and you're watching porn and you're doing crazy things because you've made touch your God. Is your business your God? Is your career your pastor? I'm sorry. I mean, I'll be at church when I can, man. I got, I got this business. I, I, I got to work. I got to get after it. I, I, I have to get this bag. I got to get it off the ground. I'm trying to climb the ladder. That's fine that you don't want to worship the God who gave you the job to begin with. That's fine. Are your kids your God? That their sports and their drama and their activities and their relationships and their things are more important than anything that God has put before you. You've got to wrestle with that today. Who is your God? The text says, when they can't figure out who God is, the text says they throw the cargo overboard. Okay. Why is this a problem for me? I get it. It's the practice of shipmen. We'll come back to that in a couple weeks. I get it. It's the practice of shipmen. But my concern is you are a cargo ship. You are a cargo ship that threw your cargo overboard. Okay. So you threw overboard the whole reason you were on the ship to begin with. Meaning what was on the ship was the whole point of you being on the ship. In other words, what the text is trying to teach us is that these men threw their purpose overboard. I'm preaching way better than y'all responding. I'm going to preach it anyway. The reality is God has called you to some things, and when life gets difficult, you put it down. The reality is that the purpose that God has for us to fulfill in this life, that as soon as our feathers get ruffled, we throw it overboard. As soon as it gets difficult, as soon as we can't add it up, we throw it overboard. And this is all I'm trying to tell you. You got to stop letting sin steal your purpose. Especially somebody else's sin. This wasn't even their drama. It was Jonah who was in sin running from the Lord. And Jonah had caused them so much pain that they threw over their livelihood. They threw their purpose over, over what somebody else was causing. And here's my problem. Where's Jonah in all of this? Sleep. In the bottom of the ship. He sleep at the bottom of of the ship. And hear me, y'all. Why is this important? A storm is raging and Jonah is asleep. You've got to be careful of being so far from God that when a storm shows up, it doesn't wake you up. You're so distant and so disconnected that winds are blowing and waves are crashing and you're asleep. Thus, God will often use a storm to get your attention. Because God's hope for you is not destruction, it's destiny if you would just wake up. I know you messed up. Wake up. I know it was a problem for you. It's okay. Wake up. I know it hurts. 
I know it's a thorn. I know there were consequences. Wake up. I, I know that you didn't like it and it didn't feel good and it didn't work out how you thought it was going to work out. But wake up up. Don't you stay down there sleep in the bottom of that boat. There is still a God in heaven that says if you wake up and if you look up, I am still available in your life. Wake up. You gotta wake up. You have to be careful of intentional rebellion got to be mindful of impactful results. But finally, be grateful for an insightful response. The captain wakes Jonah and then grabs his men. After he wakes him, he grabs his men because he said, this dude ain't doing anything. The Bible says that they begin to cast lots to see who caused the storm. Let me help you with your Bible. Casting lots is just an ancient Near Eastern practice uh, that they would do in a sense to try to call on the divine in order to, to let God navigate which direction they should go. So they're not shooting dice like at the casino. It's not the same thing. That they are casting lots. Jesus, help me. Okay? Now, the reason why this is important because we can give credit to these polytheistic men for knowing that a divine being had to be the cause of this. And when they cast the lots, the Bible says that the lot falls to Jonah. I'm done, I promise you. The shipmen then, when they go to Jonah, this is so important to me, here's your response. When the shipmen go to Jonah, they give us a formula for dealing with the storm. Because when the issue is revealed, they interrogate it. Here's what it is. They're going to put it on the wall. Go ahead, Toby, because they ask four questions. They ask four questions. There it is. What do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? And who is your people? And they ask four specific questions to Jonah. I'll repeat them. What do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? Who is your people? I could preach a whole message on these four questions. Uh, uh, they they, they want to know about his profession. They want to know about his past. They want to know about his people. They want to know about his place. It might be two of you in here, but I'm going to talk to you in a way. Let me talk to some single people in here and tell you these four questions you need to ask. That before you connect permanently or intimately with anybody, you got four questions for them. What do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? Who is your people? You not understand it. What do you do? Do you have a job? Where do you work? Is it a full-time job? Is this a career or a hobby? Do you have ambition, drive, or a plan? What do you do? Here's the next question. Where do you come from? In other words, what have you left behind you that you might be bringing with you? I, I need to know what kind of baggage you carrying with these suitcases. I, I need to know what's behind you. Then he asked, they asked, what is your country? Why is that important? Because in the text, your country was connected to a covenant. The where was connected to worship, meaning your country determined your God. I'm still trying to help some single people in here because if they don't worship the God you worship, it need to stop right then. The country was connected to the relationship. And then he asked, who was your people? Meaning, who your mama and them? Because if she crazy, you might be too. I Now, 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 why? Why would they, why, why would they ask that? Because the sailors are trying to figure out, Jonah, 
What did you do? They, they need to know his profession because if he's a merchant, they might be asking, did you steal from somebody? They're, 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 they're asking about his past because they want to know who you running from. Who, who have you offended? Right? They're asking about his country because they need to know what army about to pull up. What, what God have you offended? Because now we can talk about this. They're asking about his place because they want to know, are we headed home to some help or are we headed far away? Because okay, here's what it is. Because his response to those questions, y'all, determines their reaction. They want to get it right. Now, if we read the text, Jonah answers the question. He says, Yahweh is my God. I am a Hebrew. He says, yep, it's all my fault. He says, my bad. Watch the text. He says, throw me overboard. And the storm will come. Okay. Throw me overboard and the sea will get still. It's about to get real tight. Hold me up, Lord. He says, throw me overboard, and the text says, they hesitate. And when they hesitate, the storm rages harder. Because you have to be careful that you are hesitant to remove what's causing a storm in your life. I know, I'm not even going to look at y'all. I I know that's been your friend since forever. I, I know y'all go way back like four flats on a Cadillac. But if they keep causing drama in your life, it might be time to throw that relationship overboard. I know you've had it for a long time. I know you like it, it made you feel good, but it's not moving you forward into what God has called you to. You might have to throw it overboard. I know that's your baby. I know you love them and that's your kid and you do anything for them, but if they can't make better decisions, you're going to have to throw them overboard. You're going to have to be like the father in Luke 15 and say, you're going to have to go and I'll sit here and watch for you when you come to yourself. It's tight, but it's right. I'm sorry. I'm going to preach this Bible. You're going to have to throw it overboard. You're going to have to look at all of what is happening and make a decision that I cannot keep this in my life. Why? The response is insightful, y'all, because God watches all of this and lets it play out. He doesn't intercede and tell them don't throw him overboard. He doesn't say stop this. He lets it all play out, and they pick Jonah up and pray, God, please, because, Lord, we just didn't, we, we trust in that, or what he said, and they throw him into the sea. And the Bible says, you Sunday school graduates, that a fish swallows him up, and the chapter ends like that. That's how it ends. It ends with Jonah in the belly of a fish. I know you graduated from Sunday school. You heard belly of a whale. That ain't what the Bible say. It say the belly of a fish. But the reason why we say whale, because it says a large fish. Now, now, uh, uh, let, me, let me see if I can help you with this. If we assume a whale, I, I'll describe it to you this way. If you assume a whale, a whale is five suburbans long, bumper to bumper. It is three suburbans wide, door to door. And it is three suburbans high, tires to roof. If you add all that up, that would be seating for 315 people. And yet, a whale's throat is only large enough for small fish. It can't swallow big things. It is designed to only swallow little people. What am I trying to tell you? That the fish's mouth was a perfect fit for Jonah. Here's what all I'm trying to get you to understand. I'm done. That the storm should have killed him. That the sea would have killed him. But the fish kept him safe. 
I, 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 I preached this whole message just to tell you this one line, and I'll have you come for prayer, that even if you cause the storm, this is what I need you to get, that the Lord can keep. That when the sea should have killed you, when the storm should have killed you, God can send a fish to keep you when you can't keep yourself. Well, you, you need to understand, the fish wasn't Jonah's plan A. It wasn't his plan B. It wasn't what he expected. But God is so good that he can send what you least expect what you didn't count on, what you were not looking for, and it will keep you in the midst of the storm. And here it is. The fish kept him safe long enough for him to realize that his purpose was more important than his preferences. That what God called him to was more important than what he wanted to do on his own. All I'm here to tell you is that God will keep you. Here it is. Why? Here's a question that I ask God. Why would God keep someone like Jonah? Jonah got mad at you. Jonah ran from you. Jonah paid to get away from you. Jonah went to sleep on you. Jonah even tried to commit suicide because here's the question we really need to ask. Why didn't Jonah repent? Why did he want to jump ship? Because he was still in his feeling. And yet the Lord still kept this unre, stubborn, arrogant, mad, shamed man. And I asked God, why would God keep someone like Jonah? God said the same reason I'd keep someone like you. That I kept Jonah and I kept you. Here it is. Because that's, that's just who I am. In case you needed to know who God is, that's the kind of God that we serve. That's just who he is. That who you are does not change who he is. That what you've done does not change who he is. That where you've been does not change who he is. That no matter how many mistakes you've made, it does not change who God is. That God said, I'm the kind of God that'll keep you even when you don't want to be kept. When you were ready to throw in the towel, I kept you. When you were ready to give up on life, I kept you. When, when you were done and down and depressed, I kept you. When you had no options and no money and no free, I kept you. When you were laying in your sin, I kept you because that's who I am. That in case we forgot, you serve a keeping God. He will hold you in his hand and keep you. Every head bow, every eye close. God, we thank you today. You are a keeping God. That you hold on to us even when we don't want to be kept. God, I pray that you would deal with the tension in this temple of those who have had broken hearts because they were sailors who didn't expect Jonah to get on that boat. That you would deal with the mess and the misery of those who have been like Jonah and they have run from you. You remind them that you see them, that you care for them, that you keep them. God, how we love you and we thank you. Jesus.